Hello, this is your host, Sierra Cornell, and welcome to Songwriters Unblocked. With new episodes released weekly, the show is an in-depth exploration of the songwriting process. I interview writers from all genres and backgrounds, and we have conversations on the ins and outs of inspiration, effective storytelling, overcoming writer's block, and more. From the nuts and bolts of songwriting theory to the emotional side of putting your hopes and fears out into the world, I go deep with each one of my guests to uncover what it means to be a songwriter. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the episode. Clover is a singer-songwriter currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Captivating and soulful with vocals way bigger than her body, Clover wisps you away into a world of angelic anthems. Inspired by the likes of Lake Street Dive, Leanne Le Havis, Amy Winehouse, Carol King, and Joni Mitchell, she warmly welcomes you with a blend of soul, rock, and pop that echoes timelessness. Hi, Clover. Welcome to Songwriters Unblocked. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you for being here. I'm excited. Me too. Me too. So why don't you start out by telling us about the first song that you ever wrote? Ooh, we're going there right Mm -hmm. from the start. Right from the Um, start. (laughs) The first song I ever wrote, I think I was in middle school. I remember I was working as a, like a camp counselor at the time. And I had this crush on a boy (laughs) and, um, I remember going home one day to my piano and writing this song that was like, Mr. Love, why are you in disguise? Will I ever see you without that mask over your eyes? Like, I still remember it so well. (laughs) Um, And it was super cheesy and really embarrassing. Like, I don't think I ever played it for anyone. Um, But it's funny to think back on it because I have no idea what brought me to take my emotions to the piano and write my first song. Like no one ever, no one told me to do that. Um, Mm. I don't know how the idea came to be, but if it weren't for that song, I don't know if I'd be writing. So even though it was embarrassing and uh, funny, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, it's so interesting how kids get the idea to write a song for the first time. Like, I think if you're really young, a a lot of kids kind of just sing what they're doing. Um, and then maybe it starts from there, but you know, middle school, you're aware, you're like, you know, a bit more of a, of, of a conscious person at that point. Um, but to be able to take your emotions, like you said, to the piano and be like, I'm feeling this thing. Let me write a song about it is, is interesting. Did you play piano at that point? Like, were you taking yeah, lessons? And- I had, I had taken lessons. I think when I was like five, maybe mm-hmm. five and six years old, um, And it was only for that short period of time that I took lessons, but I played piano. Like I never stopped after that. Um, Yeah. So I had played piano and I had been playing other people's songs and singing other people's songs. Um, And then, yeah, I'm so curious. I wish I could go back and know like what the moment was when it was like, oh, go sing your own words. Yeah. Um, But I don't remember. Yeah. It's funny because I've told this story on the podcast before, but I distinctly remember the first time I realized songs were written down by people because Mm. when I was, I must've been like four. It was, it's one of my first memories, like super, super young. Um, And I would just sing what came into my mind spontaneously. So it was like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, playing with my sister or I'm doing, you know, whatever outside. And, And I would sing what I was doing. And I thought music was so wild because all of these people would sing the same thing together. Like, and I was like, how did you have the same thought at the same time to be able to sing that together? Like, I didn't realize that music was written down and that you could share it with people. Um, And then my mom was like, I think I said something to her along the lines of like, how did they do that? That's so cool. And she was like, see, they write it down. And I was like, (laughs) mind blown. (laughs) Wow. My, my like three or four year old brain just like couldn't comprehend that. And I was like, well, I, if they can write it down, that means I can write it down. I can write it down. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, it's a funny, it's a funny thing to think back on. Um, Cause there's so many things like that when you're a kid that you don't 
realize are happening. Like the things that we have to learn so young are, are just kind of crazy. We're, we're now, you know, it's like a given. Well, if you want somebody to, you know, have something of yours, you, you write it down and, and they'll be able right. to keep it and remember it and repeat it. Um, but it's, I don't know. I love, I love hearing how and when people wrote their first songs because everyone's experience is so, so different and yet so similar at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And th your story is kind of reminding me of the first, I guess, maybe like for first performance I ever did when mm. I was maybe like six years old. Um, it was around the time when I was taking piano lessons and I had learned to play Lady Madonna by the Beatles on the piano. And at that time, I had this like really high pitched squeaky voice. Um, not like, and it, I mean, it sounded good, but I was only six years old. So um, I did this performance. There's a video of it um, at the school talent show. And after singing and playing the song, I didn't like, I didn't know exactly what it was, but something brought me to just start crying. Like I was like mm. so overwhelmed and I like ran to my mom and I was really overwhelmed. And now when I think about what that moment was for me, it was like, kind of the understanding without the words to be able to express it of how powerful music mm. was for me. So at that time, I didn't know anything about songwriting, but that was kind of the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a big part of my life. And I don't know what that means yet, but I'm, I'm never letting go of this thing. Yeah. Um, so that was a really like pivotal moment at six years old too. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. And I guess transitioning now into your songwriting today. So how has music been a part of your life since then? And what role does songwriting play now? Mm. Music has, has been like the biggest part of my life ever since then. Um, I do remember once I graduated from high school, and I was like applying to colleges, I still hadn't gotten it into my mind that I could like be a musician for my job. Mm. Um, it was like, okay, I'm going to continue doing music. And then like, what am I doing with my life though? Um, right. And I started studying psychology and music in college to go into music therapy. Mm. Um, kind of like coupling the idea of the emotional side of, of music and the processing that you can do through songwriting. And then like, the psychological side of things. Um, and it was through my first year, once I started studying music, I actually was like, okay, I can't split. I can't like do the psychology and music. I'm so obsessed with music. I'm just doing music. Um, and I decided if I really wanted to go into that, I could go to grad school later on, but like I was giving myself to music fully. And then once I graduated from college, um, I was presented with the opportunity to be on The Voice. So mm. I like graduated from school, flew out to LA, was filming for The Voice for a month. And then also through that time, realized that reality TV wasn't really for me. Mm -hmm. So I actually left like a few days before um, we were gonna be filming my actual audition for the show. Um, and that was another pivotal moment of just being like, how, like how much control is important for me to have over my creative process, my career, my artistry, all of those things. Um, so yeah, that was a shift from there. I moved to Brooklyn, New York, and I actually started, I just jumped right into like co-writing with people. Um, not knowing what that meant, having no background in doing anything like this, always, you know, having written alone in my room. Um, yeah, jumped into co-writing. That was a really interesting time, learned a lot through that. Um, kind of came up against some of the same things about like deciding how much control I wanted to have over what was happening. Um, and then through that kind of was like, I think I want to teach. Like, mm. I think I want to take what I'm learning through these experiences and share them with other people and kind of realize that a lot of people that I spoke with who had had like classical piano lessons when they were young or something like that didn't really resonate with the way they were taught. And so therefore they were like, music isn't for me. 
um, but still like had this, this love for music, but just didn't really have the framework that uh, made sense for them. So like, I was like, okay, maybe my teaching can incorporate or create a framework that is a little bit more accessible for people rather than something that's really technical and strict and theory based. So that's when I kind of came up with this concept for coupling mindfulness. So like meditation practices um, with songwriting and learning mm -hmm. an instrument through that process. Yeah, that was a lot of different things, but just kind of taking you along the journey. Oh my gosh, I know. I have like a million questions now. <laughs> um, but, but let's go with the, the most obvious one. Um, mindfulness and teaching songwriting. That's so cool. Um, what are some of the things that you tell your students? How does that, how do, how do those two things bridge? Yeah, I think that, so if it's a, it's a new student that I'm working with who like maybe has had the experience of having classical music lessons in the past and feeling like disconnected from music mm -hmm. in some way, my first kind of exercise or experience with them will be to show them how easy it is for them to create music on their own. So I know some, some music teachers hate when I say this because they're like, uh, writing music isn't easy. You know, you have to, you have to work really mm -hmm. hard and you have to know all these things. And that, that, yes, that's true. But at the same time, for me, I feel like it's not, it's not really a bad thing for someone to have an easeful experience the first time trying something. Like if they have an experience trying to write a song and they can do it in 30 minutes, then they're inspired and they want to learn the theory and they want to learn how to do all the other things. So it's kind of like creating that inspiration before diving like deeper into technicalities and all of that stuff. Um, and then another thing that's really important to me is having people kind of create affirmations for themselves based off of previous experiences that they may have had that have like made them feel like they're not capable of singing or playing piano or writing a song. You know, like so many people will come to me and they'll be like, I love singing, but in middle school, my choir teacher told me I was flat. So I never sang again, you know? And so creating these new stories so that they can build the confidence back up and then step back, oops, step back into music um, from a new perspective. That's really cool. And I feel like so necessary. I want to take lessons from you. <laughs> we can do like a, a little trade or something. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I resonate with that. Like I had a lot of music teachers. It was mostly instrument, um, instrument based. And I, I mean, I literally, I took my first guitar lesson when I was four. Can I play the guitar? Like kinda, like right. I should be way better at it now than, you know, given the time that I've spent in lessons, like learning this stupid instrument. And like, I can't, you know, there's something about it that like the way I was taught or, um, just my my mindset around it has always been so like you have to force this to happen you have to um you know it's going to be painful and it's going to hurt and like you know when i was 4 all i wanted to do was play the guitar so that i could sing so i could write songs like it was always right. in service of songwriting and i had a i had a teacher in college and i took a guitar class and this guitar class like totally changed my relationship to it because it was so much more about like, here's, you know, like, it doesn't matter if you don't know what chords you're playing, like here's how to play in lots of open tuning so that you can get really cool sounds really easily. Mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and it was just a completely different approach. And I think kind of incorporated a lot of the things that you're talking about, um, and made me want to play guitar. Cause that's so important when you're just learning something, when you're starting out, if, it's so hard or impossible or, you know, there are so many things built up around it um, about being perfect and playing it a very specific way. You're going to lose that motivation for it um, so fast. And I, I see it all the time. And maybe almost everybody I know started some instrument yeah. at, at a certain point and gave up because it was, you know, it didn't resonate with them in the way that it did when they started. Um, yeah. 
So I think your approach is awesome. Mm. <laughs> like really, Thank really you. cool and, and very needed. Like I said, like I think a lot of people would really benefit from that approach. And, you know, I, there's a part of it too, that is, you know, really spending the time and practicing and learning the instrument and, and working hard at it, but doing that in a way that is easeful and not a chore because yeah. I mean, I've seen it myself and I've seen it in so many people that I know where the minute it becomes a chore and you stop loving it, you don't practice. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm so happy that all of that resonated with you. And um, yeah, I see it all the time when I share what I do with people. They're like, oh, you can learn music in that way. Like, it's just not not the norm. So people mm -hmm. don't know it exists. And yeah, I'm here to just like, share that there is another way and yeah. I see it making huge shifts in so many people's lives so I'm really That's grateful so cool. I might have to steal some of your techniques because yeah you can <laughs> we definitely talk, about talk this. I, also teach. I would love to share yeah <laughs> um mm -hmm. I also hear a lot from my students um I don't know music theory therefore I can't write songs or I really want uh to know like this broad term of like theory that people just kind of like throw on music uh, when they don't really know what they're missing. And mm -hmm. I did it for the longest time where I was like, oh, I need to learn music theory. I need to learn music theory. And it was, it's maybe 50% music theory. The other 50% is, is that I think what you're talking about that, you know, the mindset around it, the, um, your approach to the music, how you uh, use the theory. Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of theory. Do I use it all? No. If I did use it all, <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I'd be a much better player and musician than I am. But uh, it's bridging those two can be really hard. And if yeah, it, at least hard in the way that most people approach it. And I often have to tell my students, you, you know, I'm going to explain this concept to you, but you don't need it. You just need to know how, or, or you, you're going to use it even if you don't know what it's called. Oftentimes that's right. what happens. Or um, we do have to go into some more nitty gritty stuff so that they understand, you know, what chords they can use or mm -hmm. what chords are going to sound good and what chords might sound a little weird <laughs> in their right. song. And it's all in service of, okay, you know, this emotion comes from this chord and then we can apply this chord to the words that you're saying and don't, you know, showing them the yeah. difference between what a major chord is going to sound like over those words versus a minor chord. And I've had some, totally. some students that are like, oh, I get it. And I'm like, yeah, this is the music theory that you're kind of, you're, you're aiming at, you know, this, this very useful knowledge of translating these emotions into sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I've talked to, so like while I was in, in college, I was in mostly a jazz ish program. Um, and I had almost no theory experience other than like the naturally learned theory I had through writing songs, mimicking my favorite artists, all of those things. Um, and in this jazz program, there were people who had been studying music very seriously from like young age. And I would talk to them and I'd be like, I know nothing. And it's really intimidating that like all of you, most of the, I was like one of the only vocalists, most of them like played saxophone or piano or all these things. Um, but they were like, actually, sometimes I feel like all of the knowledge that I have of this theory kind of like stunts my ability to be emotional in the music. Like, you know, their, their brains are so focused on the technique and doing all the right things when it comes to music theory that they've lost the just kind of the freedom to just get lost in the music and and be emotional in that way. So I think you're right that it's like bridging the two and finding that balance is is really important. And that's like finding that sweet spot is not so easy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you have there's there's a pretty big portion of people that get stuck in this this theory world where it's like okay this works this doesn't work here are the rules here's what I can do mm -hmm. here's what I can't do and 
not being able to translate that into emotion is very, it's, it's, it stunts a lot of the creative process. But at the same time, you have people who, when they really understand it and are able to overcome that, like I think of like Stevie Wonder, I mm-hmm. mean, like a master of music and was able to use all of this complex harmony in a way that was purely emotional. And <clears throat> I think that's what I've always aspired to. I mean, I'm very far, <laughs> very, very far <laughs> from uh, Stevie Wonder, but the people that I, at least I've met in my life that really have that full, like deep, complete understanding of theory with the emotional component of this chord is going to express this emotion in this way. Um, yeah. That's just like the coolest thing ever. Like I, I admire people who have that so much because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, of stuff in the way getting, you know, keeping people from really diving into that, that theory. And then, um, feeling like it's it's a chore and that you have to you know force your way through it to reach this other side but I don't think I don't know I just don't think that's the case I'm not sure I'm not sure that approach gets you to that to that end yeah yeah and when you said Stevie Wonder I was also I was thinking Stevie Wonder and Jacob Collier like yeah you know Jacob Collier yeah Mm -hmm. um he's someone who I think makes it's so accessible for so many people. And I also, I'm nowhere near that, but like Mm -hmm. also aspire and learn so much from him. So, um, there are definitely people out there who are, who are doing it right. Absolutely. Totally. And good for you for seeing this issue and bringing your teaching in to address it. Cause, and Mm. and I, I, something you said earlier about, uh, songwriting uh, or a lot of people saying that, you know, it takes a lot of effort and you have to know so many things to write a song. And I was talking in another interview uh, with George Woods about this. And he said, no, everything is a song. He's like writer's block mm-hmm. doesn't exist because literally, you know, your footsteps are a rhythm, your, uh, you know, the sounds of in the kitchen in the morning are, are melodies. Everything mm-hmm. around you can be a song. It's just, do you choose to call it a song or not? And I, I've I always that so remembered much. that. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's so true because we can get really wrapped up in what things need to sound like or what they should be or shouldn't be. And that's when we get stuck. That's when we cut ourselves off and, I mean, I've been experiencing like so much of that this year, (laughs) Um, Mm. trying to write in genres that are a bit unfamiliar to me and pushing myself in different directions where I think it's been great. Like I've grown so much as a songwriter, but at the same time, it's been very difficult to be able to return to that where it's like, okay, you know, when I write for myself, it doesn't have to sound any sort of way. I'm Mm -hmm. very much in my work, like all of the rules, like here's what the artist is going for. Here's the sound. This is the vibe, you know, all of these conventions of the genre and like learning and understanding uh, and being able to like separate that from my songwriting. It's it's been a little difficult, but I think I've learned a lot through it because- Yeah, sounds hard. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's all- it's all part of the same world, yet your approach is different. And I think truly anyone can write a song. Anyone can. And it may seem like there are lots of components and and pieces to it, which there are to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, it's you all, you have it all already. You don't need Mm. to learn complex jazz theory. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, I just remembered. So have you ever heard of this um, group called School of Song? It's like an online, it's actually based in California, I think. Okay. Um, but it's an online school. They get different artists from all different genres to come in and teach songwriting classes. And maybe they'll have like four classes in a month right now. I'm actually doing one with, um, I think his name is Scott McKinnon from Dr. Dog. Um And I previously did one with Bridget Kearney from Lake Street Dive. So Mm. this is like another, it's different than what what I'm doing in my lessons, but like it's another way for people to get into, hopefully like people who are listening, if you want to try a new approach to 
songwriting or just like hear how other artists are doing it. Um, it's a really, it's a really um, accessible way for people to get into songwriting. So like what you were just saying, like anyone can do it. This, when you take these classes, there could be as many as 40 people in a class up to like, depending on how big the artist is, like 400 people in the class and everyone's at different levels. And it's just, um, I, I'm really inspired by them also going down this path of like, what's an alternative way to help people learn music, learn how to write songs. Um, that's really accessible. So school of song, mm. check them out. School of song. Okay. I will yeah. definitely have to check them out. That's awesome. So I guess we can shift the conversation a little bit. We've been talking yeah, I know. about We're teaching just like, for a while. We're just like so <laughs> geeky teachers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could have a a whole hour long podcast just about teaching, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal songwriting process. Um, it sounds like, you know, you have such a unique and important approach to teaching. How do you approach your own writing? Hmm. So I am a very emotional person. I'm very like, connected to my own emotions and also sensitive to other people and how they're feeling. Um, outside of that first song that I wrote when I was in like middle school, the next few songs that I wrote were all about me kind of like processing in high school, my parents, their relationship was really rocky. They got a divorce. I ended up going to boarding school. So there was like a whole lot of uprooting and, um, change in my life. Um, so all of my songs during that time were to help me process what was going on. So whenever I'm feeling something, the first thing I do is like turn to music and songwriting. Um, and that hasn't really changed. I mean, my life is a lot more stable. I'm in like a long-term relationship, so I'm not really writing about breakups anymore. You know, like the, the the situations in my life have shifted, but because I am such a sensitive person, I can't help but I can't help but feel and feel a lot. And um, yeah, I don't know. My first instinct is always to turn to songwriting. So, for the actual process of what it looks like when I go to do that, it's usually kind of a messy heap of me singing and playing chords at the same time. I hardly ever have like a moment of just like writing out lyrics and then going to a piano or having a chord progression I really like and then writing out lyrics to it. It's like kind of a all at once tornado thing. Um, and it's only more recently that I've started to get a little bit more, I guess, experimental when it comes to that process. So I know I'm really comfortable in that zone of just sitting at a piano and something's gonna happen. I know that. But now I've started, you know, keeping notes in my phone of just like random lines of lyrics and maybe random chord progressions that I hear that I really like and sitting down and working from that. So um, recently I had this line in my phone that just said soft shell Scorpio. And it was kind of this concept that I had in my head of like, I don't know, I don't know that much about zodiac signs and like that kind of stuff and horoscopes, but I have had experiences of like, I don't know, maybe people telling me some characteristics of Scorpios or encountering Scorpio Scorpios and having certain like experiences. Um, and then I had this idea of like, and I guess Scorpios are a little bit more like do you know about Scorpios yeah. before I say something wrong? I do. Do you want to talk, tell me, <laughs> tell tell me something listeners. about Scorpios? Tell, no, t do you, can you explain oh, a you little bit about explain, character, oh, okay, okay. characteristics of Scorpios? Just a few, th throw Scorpios, a few out. Yeah, they tend to be um, very, uh, very emotional, but like deeply emotional and, and maybe a little closed off. In, yeah, like a lot of, okay. you know, water signs are definitely more of the emotional sign because um, water is kind of the emotional um, element. Uh, but Scorpios, to me at least, and uh, I am no expert, but I just have a lot of Scorpio friends. <laughs> okay, um, so you know. <laughs> I, I do know, yeah. I, to me, Scorpios are, are usually a bit like 
darker in the tone mm-hmm. of their emotion and maybe closed off because it is such like a deep like well like I would say like cancers are more of like an ocean where Scorpios are like a well <laughs> mm. if that makes sense like like this is maybe so perfect wider versus deeper I don't know also maybe I'm completely wrong no this is like a fantastic <laughs> I'm so glad that you explained <laughs> because it's, it's absolutely perfect with what I'm trying to say so like yeah with that kind of like darkness and deepness mm-hmm. there's I feel like, and the closed offness that you speak of, that's kind of what I've experienced. And then I had this encounter with um, someone who I thought as a Scorpio had more of like a soft shell, you know, like Mm. a soft shell, uh, soft shell crab. Yeah. Uh, So I was thinking like scorpion, but like soft shell, like, Mm -hmm. and kind of like a permeable layer where um, they were letting me see more of them than what I had experienced in the past with like a more closed off, like harder shelled Scorpio. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I had that concept in my phone from, I don't even know how long ago. And I, so I sat down at the piano. I'm like, I'm going to try something different. I'm just going to pick a random line from something I have in my phone and go off of that. And then I, because I started from a different way than I usually do, my mind was more open to even what like the arrangement of the song would sound like. So all of a Mm -hmm. sudden I was like sampling my vocals and making a beat out of the vocals, which is like so different than me sitting at the piano and playing chords and singing along to it. Um, So yeah, making a beat out of my vocals, like working more so on the songwriting process in logic so that I had so many different things at my fingertips. And um, yeah, I've just been getting more into that now and I'm loving it. That's awesome. That's super cool. And approaching songwriting in a new way is always going to give you something different. And I don't know, it's always exciting for me because you get stuck in your ways pretty often, or at least I do, where I'll go through periods of, you know, a few months here where I'm kind of doing the same thing just in different ways. And then eventually I'll graduate into the next little (laughs) phase of my, of my songwriting. But I, I'm always so lyric driven and Mm. I've this past year I've been doing a lot of R&B writing and R&B is very very melodic and Mm -hmm. going into sessions and just doing melody passes before you even think about lyrics was super new for me and it's made me just so much better like so much better as a writer because there were I, I would put the story before I would put the melody often I would say maybe two years ago, that was everything. Like I would really, really focus on the lyrics and take the first melody that came to my mind. And once I stopped doing that, I was like, oh wait, there are so many different options here. And the melody is really such an important part. I mean, people would argue it's more important than lyrics. Um, Right. To a certain degree, I kind of agree with that now. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I was going to say that like intuitively, Mm -hmm. Someone might think, oh, the lyrics are what's going to get the listener's attention the most. Right. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that like if the melody, it's the like if the the melody is what carries the lyrics and if Mm -hmm. that like track that the lyrics are on isn't engaging or, you know, catching the attention of the listener, then the lyrics might just like fly yeah. by they might not even hear what you're saying so yeah, yeah. I, def- I, I definitely agree with that too and I've I haven't always thought that way as well um but I feel like now hearing your, that you've had that experience I think for me also just like watching my trajectory as a songwriter lyrics are what came first for me too mm-hmm. and it wasn't until later on that I was like oh wait melody duh right. that's like we need we really need that here <laughs> yeah yeah and I find that they really inform each other like as depending on the number of syllables in a word or the stress of the word, you're going to have different melodies that come to mind or different melodies that will work, different melodies that won't work based on the measures and where, you know, that word falls in the measure. And that's been super interesting to me now, I think in this era of songwriting that I'm in is, is messing around with that and noticing, I I don't know, I think SZA is so good at doing that, how she phrases her words and how her sentences kind of like run into each other over bars. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, 
such an interesting way of songwriting because I'm usually very, I, I would say I was mostly in like the folk singer songwriter world um, before I, I would say pretty much my entire life until maybe two years ago. And then I, I got into the pop and R&B world. Um, but folk music is, is pretty uh, repetitious in its melodic nature and, um, you know, very, very story driven, very, very lyric driven. Um, and I had a hard time kind of breaking out of that form when I started mm -hmm. writing R&B and started writing pop music. And uh, it's been very freeing and really cool to see all the different ways you can play with rhythm, the ways you can play with words and um, stresses and stretching things out or making things shorter. And, and that's been the most fun for me recently. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. You can get really creative in that way. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, you totally can. And um, I think it's... I love hearing people's approaches because we all have things that we kind of naturally gravitate towards, whether it's lyrics, whether it's harmony, whether it's melody. I was in a session yesterday and uh, the artist was very, very harmony driven. And I was like, this is awesome. Like I usually don't even think about it. Like you could give me two chords and I could write an entire song, <laughs> uh, like right. no problem. And you know, all the sections would be different and whatever, but, uh, just seeing him play the keys and kind of work with the producer and really figure out the feel and the flow of that progression uh, inspired something new that we wouldn't have gotten had we just kind of done my approach and um, <laughs> said screw chords. I mean, not screw chords, you know, you know what I mean? Like chords are great. <laughs> and, and having a progression that like really, um, evolves and matches the emotion of your words. So important. So, so important. Um, but I just, I love people. I, I love working with people who are really in tune with that because it's not my strength by any means. Yeah. So. Yeah. Amazing. This is also making me think about like, it's, it's a little harder for me to do this in, I'm living in Brooklyn. So in mm -hmm. New York city, uh, this is a little hard, but I had been living in upstate New York where access to nature and being alone in nature was mm. like really easy. And another thing I started finding myself doing there when it came to songwriting was like going on a walk in the woods and yeah. just like singing anything, starting just like, you know, uh, writing a song from nothing, just be, or maybe actually it wasn't just from nothing. Like I, I remember like looking at a waterfall and the waterfall is basically like giving me the song. It was like, this is, this is what you're writing about now. This is how it sounds. And kind of just like interacting with nature and writing from that and not having any chords because I don't know, I don't have perfect pitch. I have no idea what key I'm in. I don't even know what time signature I'm in. I like wrote something that was like in 13 or something really, <laughs> really, really weird. Um, just being in the middle of the woods by myself, making voice memos and then bringing them home and be like, okay, what is this with chords, with, you know, drums or a groove? Um, and that's like, yeah, another really experimental way that I've been enjoying writing that's so cool I love that I might do that today I'll go outside yeah well. give it a go <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's I I find it and I think there's you know there's nothing wrong with this approach but it always kind of um it, it's always surprising to me when I hear somebody say like oh you know I've just been in my room for weeks straight writing music and that's awesome. I mean, if you could stay in your room and just have all those ideas right there in your mind, like you go for <laughs> it, spend as much time as you want by yourself in your room. But I need outside, like mm -hmm. I need people, I need like to feel the energy of the world. If I spend too much time in this room, I go absolutely crazy. And mm -hmm. I love just, you know, whether it's sitting in a park or, and I live, I live in LA. So there are like you know, there are parks, like I could go to nature. It's just kind of a, a trek. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've been missing recently, just like an outdoor space. that's quiet that has some trees. And I, yeah. I think so many good ideas come from that environment and come from that approach, right? Where, you know, you didn't have an instrument, you weren't worried about anything other than that melody in that moment mm -hmm. with whatever came to you. And then, I mean, those ideas are so so important to continue because they come from something that's a unique experience and, and then it can, it can grow into anything. And I, 
you're you're inspiring me again. I need to I need to go outside Woo. and write some songs. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I also did, um, this was different for me because I, I just can't do this all the time, but I just did a three-day solo songwriting retreat in a cabin upstate. Um, and that was a really crazy experience for me too because I'm someone who, I love being alone. Like I love time alone. Um, right now I'm living in a studio apartment with my boyfriend and it's it's hard when you're living in one room with two people like to be alone. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I did this trip upstate wrote three songs in three days and um actually experienced like feeling lonely and mm -hmm. needing people um because in this cabin it had been snowing so there's a snowstorm I couldn't really go outside and have this experience we're talking about where like you know you walk around comfortably in right. not freezing weather and <laughs> write a song like I, I was like shivering yeah. I couldn't do that so I was really stuck inside um and I, I was super productive, that's for sure. But then coming out of it, I was like, I need to go be with some people. And there happened to be actually a dance retreat that was like happening an hour away. So mm. the night I finished the third song, it was like 9 p.m. I drove an hour to a dance retreat and just like danced with hundreds of people. And I was like, OK, got <laughs> I got my community now. So I feel you though of like needing the energy of others. Like I didn't expect that from myself because I do love solo time and I love writing alone. Um, but yeah, I needed, needed yeah. people and energy after that solo cabin time. That's maybe I have to go do a three day solo retreat in the cabin now too. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, there's such a, an interesting difference between the process of writing with other people and by yourself. I think both are super important. I think if, you know, you, the idea of writing with other people is terrifying, you got to go do it because it's so, it's so wonderful to collaborate and come out with a product that would have been completely impossible by yourself. Like, I've never written a song with other people where I'm like, this exact song could have come just out of me. Like, it, it can't. Like, that's the nature of collaboration. And I, I'd i certainly write my best songs with other people. I don't think everyone's necessarily like that. But co-writing, as much as I have these past few years, has been so amazing for my songwriting. And at the same time it's made my solo writing hurt a little bit <laughs> in oh. a way that I wasn't expecting. And I think it's, um, at least for me right now, I've, I think it would be very helpful to, you know, maybe go into the woods for a few days and try to write by myself. But um, there's, I think there's a balance to be had with any songwriter, you know, like what is your preference and how can you like lean into that and get the songs out of that space that you know, are going to be special and amazing to you and then also stretch yourself into that other realm. So mm -hmm. for me right now, I, I mean, I didn't really start co-writing co until two years ago. Um, and everything before that was mostly just on my own. And now I see the difference between like those songs on my own that I wrote then and the songs that I'm writing on my own now are completely different. And I'd say the ones now, they're, they're a bit harder. They're, it's certainly not as mm. easy as it used to be, but it's different in a way that I think is really, really great for, for my writing personally. And I would encourage anyone listening to, if you don't write well by yourself, go spend some time and really try to dive into your own process in that way. And if you hate writing with other people, go do that. Go find a person maybe again three days three days just try it out I think you'll get a lot out of it because I certainly have yeah I have a question um mm -hmm. for you like how did you find I guess like your community of co-writers because like I said when I first got out of college I kind of got thrown into co-writing without knowing I like had no knowledge of what that meant I had been a solo songwriter for so many years mm -hmm. and um had I didn't choose the people I was writing with you know mm. it's just kind of like placed in these rooms and it wasn't always the best fit or most like nourishing space for the way that I write 
Um, so yeah, I'm curious, how do you find like your people? Yeah. That you work really well with. It's, it's interesting. Cause I think everyone, there, there are, are a lot of really great experiences and then there are some bad experiences. And I, I, I know a lot of people who have been in a similar situation where they were like, I was just thrown into these sessions and now I hate it because this, it wasn't good for my process or these people weren't right. And a lot of co-writing is finding those people and finding and building the relationship because there are some, and I mostly work with artists. So there are some artists that are very open to writers and other artists who are not. And being able to build a relationship is really great. Like I've been writing with an artist for maybe maybe a year now. And I would say we had a session on Saturday. And that session, I feel like, was really the first session where we really got each other. And we were able to write, I think, our best song. Mm. And others, uh, other artists, it's day one. And we get an amazing song. So mm -hmm. the first thing I would say to, you know, people struggling to find co-writers or a community of, of writers is to give it time because you never know how it's going to evolve. And it's pretty, it's like decently rare to find people that you just like immediately click with. I think that's always the goal and you always want to find that. And those are the people that are really going to hold you through your entire career are those people where it's like, yes, we can just hit the ground running and, and make this work. But part of co-writing is really being able to understand what the room needs from you and be able to lean in and lean out. So mm. I found most of my people, honestly, through through college. Um, I went to music school and started co-writing, I would say, really my last semester there um, and then moved to LA. And ever since then, I've been connected through the people that I knew in college to other people from our same school and um, people that are not in our same school. So it's I would say it all started there. That, that was, it's really kind of like the origin of my network of people, but part of it has also been networking on my own and reaching out to people that I, well, I like. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, oh, I think your artist project is really cool. Let's write together or... Um, finding friends of friends who will recommend me or I've also noticed that if I am posting about the sessions that I'm doing and tagging people in it then other people will be like oh you know this person let's have a session together or oh you know this person who knows this person like I'm going to connect you guys so I think being public about your sessions if you're looking to find more collaborators and this is something that I really didn't do until recently um Post, post about who you're working with because you never know where that network is going to lead you. Like I was in a session yesterday um, with a producer and we went to the same school and we were talking, we were like, we probably know some of the same people, but like the people he said, I didn't know the people I said he didn't mm -hmm. know. So um, we were like, ah, oh, yeah, we probably just have like tangential connections. And then I come home and my roommate who didn't go to our school was like, oh, he was literally over here like a month ago. <laughs> um, so you wow. never know who's going to know who. And yeah. he only knew that because I posted, um, you know, a picture of the session on my story. And then he was like, Oh yeah. wait, connections. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's really a small world. Like it's a really, really small world. And if you're being really intentional about co-writing with people and about, um, reaching out, people will find you. They, they, they will. And, um, invest in relationships that you really love and those relationships will turn into more relationships. Don't just go after the people that have the name or that have uh, the following or whatever it may be because, I mean, I've been also in sessions with people who have 
quite a following and we don't vibe and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to vibe with everybody, but you also do need to give everybody a chance. And I've had some of, you know, my best sessions with in a room of people where I was like, I'm not sure this is going to (laughs) work. So (laughs) all of this to say, like, be open, be, uh, start with the network that you do have and invest in the relationships that you genuinely want to continue. Like if you have a great time writing with some people, keep writing with them. And then that their network will become your network and you will, you will be able to, you know, really build your own community around that. The other thing like this podcast has been awesome for finding collaborators and people. So if there's a I'm space, sure. if there's a space that you can make yourself, um, whether maybe it's a show that you organize once a month, maybe it's, yeah. um, you know, some sort of like songwriting feedback group or a podcast or whatever it is. If you want to try to build your own community and kind of be the center of that and bring people in, it's an amazing way to also collaborate with people and and meet new people. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer. No, that, oh, that was so, all of that was so perfect. <laughs> such, such good advice. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you I for sharing. That, <laughs> I hope that's useful to people because it's something I struggled with a lot when I first got out here was knowing how to connect with other co-writers and, and artists and people. And it's certainly not easy and I'm not the type to really like go sell myself on you know to everybody I meet like (laughs) I I admire people who are like that who are like yeah let's let's just do it and I've I've had to adopt some of that um very open and um, extroverted energy to create this community but it's always worked out so it's been a little scary but go for it and amazing I promise it'll it'll pay off (laughs) (laughs) um so shifting again why don't you tell tell us a little bit about your inspiration and your influences when it comes to songwriting like who has had the most impact on you as a songwriter well going back to the beginning because I feel like that's a good place to start um I remember guess it was the beginning of high school, like watching 500 Days of Summer. Do you remember that movie? Yes. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, I don't actually remember anything that happened in it, but I know that's the movie I was watching. (laughs) And there were two songs in that movie that I was like, who is this? Not knowing that both of them were written by the same person and that both of them were the same artist. I was just like, what is this music? I love this. Um, and it was Regina Spector. Mm -hmm. Do you know Mm -hmm. her? Yeah. Yeah. So she was kind of the first person that got me into songwriting. And I think it's because like she kind of had the singer songwriter vibe, but she was also really quirky and weird and kind Mm -hmm. of had this mix of like, like commercial appeal and artsy and really like weird. Um, so it was, it was inspiring to me. Um, and then as I, you know, I, I kind of like started writing songs was definitely really inspired by her. And then, like I said, once I got to college, I was studying more jazz and I got into jazz and soul music. So, um, was like, yeah, studying the classics and the real book and all of that stuff. Um, and during that time, I think because of the culture of the school and like the program that I was in, I started like growing this aversion to pop music that like Mm -hmm. wasn't really natural for me. It was only because everyone else was like, super jazz heads and I was like wait I come from the pop world but I guess that's not accepted here so like I've got to push that aside and like get into this jazz world um but at the same time I was able to kind of find this space between the two jazz and pop which was kind of soul soul music and during that time, I was really obsessed with the band Lake Street Dive. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rachel Price, the vocalist for Lake Street Dive, has been like one of my main influences vocally ever since I heard She's her so sing. Good. She's amazing. So I know. Um, so in college, I ended up doing a vocal workshop with her. Um, and yeah, my my new kind of like genre I found myself in was soul. So kind of like started singer-songwriter, 
started learning about jazz and then found soul, um, soul music. Um, and I didn't really know at the time, like who was writing the songs for Lake Street Dive because they're a band. I was like, I don't know if it's this member or this member or what's going on there. Um, but it turned out that a lot of the songs that I really loved were written by the bass player, Bridget mm -hmm. Kearney, who was on the School of Song, uh, in the School of Song workshop that I took recently. So um, it was, it's just so funny, like when you don't know who's writing songs and you love them, and then every time you look them up, it's the same person. You yeah. know, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it's like, oh, of oh, course yeah. that person wrote that song. Like, For sure. Of course that mm -hmm. person wrote that song. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she's been a big influence. Um, and then once after graduating college, finding my way into the soul world and then like having time away from college, now I'm like falling so in love with pop music again. And I'm like, La like loud and proud about it you know I can mm -hmm. kind of shed I don't know if you, you you went to a different music school so it was probably different but for me coming from a school where the program was like just really not supportive of pop music mm -hmm. and kind of like looked down upon it I it was hard to be a loud and proud pop musician and mm -hmm. pop songwriter you know um so now though uh yeah I'm just like finding my new love for pop and it's so much fun um mm -hmm. an artist I'm super inspired by right now is Caroline Polachek do you know her mm -hmm. yeah yeah totally. and I love her writing again I think I mean it's very different than Regina Spector but mm -hmm. she also has this kind of like she's really commercial and at the same time really freaking weird and mm -hmm. so I'm super into people who are like I guess have that blend yeah um yeah. Yeah, totally. That's, I don't know if that answers the question. That's no, it journey. does. <laughs> I, I think it just it, it shows how many places we pull inspiration from to create the songs and the sound that we have now. And yeah, pop music gets a bad rep. <laughs> it totally um, does. I'm it like, was just so funny <laughs> to me now, like writing pop. And it's I, I think I had more of an anti-pop stance in high school because I was like I'm moody and I'm cool right I you know I'm alternative and I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> but feeling like pop music was cookie cutter but then listening to the same folk songs you know that were just as cookie cutter just in a different genre or the same yeah. musical theater songs or whatever it was like I I didn't realize until college that, you know, you have, th there are, you know, trailblazers who make different sounds and are doing something different are usually really the people that pop off <laughs> and that end up charting. And, and so much of charting music is different from pop music. And a lot of stuff that kind of like sits like squarely in the genre is is pretty um, derivative of each other, I guess, in a way mm -hmm. that makes it sound all the same. Um, yeah. And being able to find those artists within each genre that are really, you know, pushing the boundaries and doing something different and um, actually being, you know, alternative or whatever you want to call it is – it's not really a, a factor of genre so much. And and oftentimes, you know, the pop music that does really well is doing something pretty cool. Um, yeah. And writing it now was like, oh, well, you know, folk music and, you know, singer-songwriter stuff is like, it's deep and it means something more. And, you know, it's not just the shallow pop writing and I can, you know, experiment. And, and I realized that actually what was happening is a lot of that experimentation was me just not being actually all that proficient and not that good of a songwriter and then calling it art <laughs> mm. which I, I don't know maybe that's maybe we don't have enough time to really get into that conversation now because maybe that's <laughs> a bit contentious um but I I felt at least in my experience that I was I was running away from actually getting better at songwriting and disguising it under this 
this thing of, of, oh, you know, I'm different and I'm artsy and I'm whatever. And not actually being able to take a look at my songs and being like, is anyone going to replay this? And, and the answer was no. Um, and now as a pop writer, I mean, that stuff is hard. Like it's, it's genuinely hard. Like if anyone could make a song pop off, people would do it all the time. Like it actually takes, right. you know, right. a lot of things, a lot of stars have to align and, you also have to have a really good song and to to write a really good song that resonates with people in the way that it it takes for a song to to be big is super difficult like i have grown so much as a writer doing pop in a way that my pretentious alternative singer songwriter self never would have expected so i think this you know what you were describing um in a in a jazz program is this this anti-pop attitude is is quite short-sighted in my opinion yeah yeah I'm happy that that resonates too (laughs) (laughs) you're giving me so many tangents to just run off of (laughs) and we've almost been talking for an hour which is insane um so unfortunately we have to wrap it up a little bit here um tell us what's on the horizon for you as a songwriter Ooh, well, I'm currently recording an album um, mm-hmm. for myself. So at the moment, my songwriting is mostly for myself as an artist. Um, so I'm in the process of recording an album. I am releasing, actually, I didn't write this song, but I'm releasing a Jimi Hendrix cover in the next two weeks. Um and I'm definitely gonna be getting more into co-writing. So if anyone is interested. Let yeah. me know. Um, yeah, that's kind of something that this year I was like, this is going to be something I'm going to be more intentional about um, because I do feel like, you know, it took me a while to get grounded and feeling strong in who I am as an artist and what I can provide and what I can, you know, bring to the table. And um, now that I have that, I want to open that up and share that with others in a way that I just like wasn't so sure of and confident before Mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome I'm excited for you that's gonna be great Mm -hmm. and where can people listen to your music and connect with you um my music is on all streaming platforms my name is clover in all capital letters and you can find me on social media at clover on the mic awesome well thank you so much for joining us today Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun, really. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Well, I hope you liked that conversation. Clover and I talked about her mindful approach to teaching, common misconceptions around music theory, different approaches to songwriting, and how to find a community of co-writers, along with so much more. So let me know what you thought about all of these ideas on Instagram. You can follow the podcast at songwriters underscore unblocked, or email us at podcast at songwritersunblocked.com. And go check out Clover on Spotify. You can find her under Clover in all caps, and hit her up on Instagram if you want to co-write. This is Songwriters Unblocked. Thanks for listening. Thank you.